Okay, <laughs> we'll get started. Um, I know there's like a, a lot going on out there today, so we're going to maybe get done in one hour, and uh, we will spend more time next week because we will go over the the homework next week. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. <coughs> if you haven't found it already, you should be following the materials on the Hemaldex page, and uh, things are being added. So now the videos are here as they come up after each lecture, and I'm just starting to put in the the name so you can find which one you're supposed to look at. And then on the uh, information for the course, I've added this uh, under required exercises must be approved to have permission to take the exam. This is the list of student names for the approved exercises. So um, what I've done is I've taken the names that are in fronter and also the names that are for the people when they signed up in class. And I put everybody's name in this list. And um, uh, there's some notes at the bottom. And it says, if you have an OK next to your name, that means I already received your exercise and approved the delivery of the exercise. You're not going to get graded on the exercise, but we are going to go over the exercise in class next week. So <coughs> the idea is that you do these in order to take the exam, and you have to at least be checked off that they were delivered. <coughs> and then uh, the yellow means that uh, you might have been in class and you signed up for the course while you were sitting in the classroom, but I haven't seen your name on the list in front of So maybe you have to check out how you get on the class list because there's a couple names that I didn't recognize. I could have spelled them wrong, uh, like not being able to read the handwritten assignment. Uh, if I put anything wrong in here, I suggest you look at this page, and if there's any corrections for spellings to be made, you should send me an email and let me know what that correction is. There's a lot of people taking the course. Um, so for exercise number one and exercise number two, you can either work by yourself or you can work with one other person. And you need to mail, email the answers to the exercise to my email address. Uh, for the first one, it's due next week at 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, the next one, you have to check the schedule when that's due. For the last exercise, I think I'm going to group you in groups of five because there's so many people we have to consolidate somehow. So, um, and when I give you a group, I will put a group number and everyone that's working together will have the same group number, okay? And you can communicate with people on your group by contacting them by email or if you happen to see them in class, that's fine too. But uh, there's some people I've provided more than one email address. OK, so that uh, file is here. And if you need to look at it, that will always be getting changed, and it will always be here. <coughs> Once again, the exam for this course is on May 15th. You can check the school schedule for that also. And um, today, we're doing uh, chapter 4. And some, some of these I have uh, found different versions of the PowerPoints, but I use the most new one available. So <laughs> once again, I have 
uh, modified the slides because they happened to me with a different version of the book. <coughs> and uh, the version we're using is version 6. So I've modified them for the purpose of today's lecture. <coughs> Okay, so we're in up to the point where we're going to be defining the project. And <coughs> so there's there's five basic steps for defining the project. And we'll talk a little bit about each. First is defining the scope of the project, and then the second establishing project priorities, creating a work breakdown structure integrating the work breakdown stru structure into the organization, and then coding the work breakdown structure for the information system. Okay. Um, the scope, uh, defining the scope of the project is one of the most important steps, because if you don't get this right, you're very unlikely to have a project that meets any kind of success criteria or it satisfies uh, all of the stakeholders that are involved in the project at the end. So it's where you say, uh, what is your mission <coughs> and, and uh, how are you going to, what are the results you're going to give to the customer? <coughs> and you have to be able to measure these results <coughs> <coughs> once you do deliver them. Um, so uh, you need to be as specific as possible, and uh, you need to define who it is you're going to be delivering it to. Uh, the, the project needs to, so you have this mission statement, which is more like your, your general, uh, what, you're, what you're doing this for, and then you're identifying who the customers are, and then you get more specific in terms of what is it you're going to deliver and who's going to, how do you know when you've done this successfully? Um, it says that the project owner and participants um, are using this as a planning tool for measuring the project success. So at the end uh, of the project, you will go back to the project scope and you will see whether or not you were successful or not. Most of the times projects are uh, judged on the criteria of it, was it done on time? Was it done within budget? And does it meet the criteria that the customer uh, set out, uh, ha you had for the customer at the beginning? So this is what needs to be checked. <coughs> so the, um, So the project uh, scope checklist is uh, you would have the project objectives and that defines uh, what you want to deliver to, to the customer. Um, and then the deliverables are also, um, uh, so the, the objective is the main goal and then the deliverables are um, sort of measurable outputs of the project. Like it may be, I'm going to deliver an information system that's functioning. And um, it allows you to, I don't know, uh, it, it's a CRP system. But it's going to be able to allow you to do accounting and, and uh, transaction orders and so forth. So uh, these are all defined in the deliverables. And then milestones are set up as uh, intermediary uh, points. So. You have a beginning of the project and you have an end, and then you might have intermediary uh, times where you check on how far you are at uh, achieving your deliverables. And then uh, technical requirements might mean that there are some uh, standards that have to be met, and uh, it can be have to do with regulations within an industry, or it might have to be, uh, have to do with functionality, for example. And then uh, limits and exclusions, meaning that uh, you can say that when I deliver this project, I'm going to have uh, a training system for uh, some personnel. 
but I'm not going to, it's not going to include um, uh, training for um, registering new customers or something like that. So you, you make a limitation on what the system will include and what it will not include. Um, <coughs> it says that uh, failure to uh, state what the limits and exclusions are can lead to false expectations and that in itself can be a problem in terms of uh, satisfying the, the customers. So you need to make it clear what it would, uh, what, in, what the finished system will include and will, what it will not include. <coughs> and uh, finally, you should also, uh, you also have a state where you, the customer reviews what you have delivered and tells you whether or not they, you have met the expectations for the, for the project. So these are the basic uh, steps for uh, outlining what it is you hope to achieve in the project at the start of the project. Okay. Um, okay. In the the um, in version six of the book, they mentioned also this uh, scope statement, which is. Um, uh, how uh, is it going? What is the um, project charter? And it has a, um, but they said that this project charter is uh, acquired a special meaning in project management. So it refers to a document that authorizes project management to initiate the lead of the project. So this uh, um, statement of uh, work or the project charter is not used as frequently anymore. It's just like a official go-ahead statement. What is an important term is uh, project uh, scope creep. And that happens when you have, uh, you've identified your project scope at the beginning of the project. And then the customers might say as time goes on, oh, I would like to see another modification to what we're doing. I would like you to add something else to the end product. And uh, this usually adds more time to the project, and, and it can add, uh, if you have more time, it will add more expenses. So um, this uh, problem of changing what is expected at the end uh, usually creates um, uh, additional cost for the project and also a, a greater chance that it will not be uh, completed on time and in budget and to meet the expectations of people that were set out in the, in the scope of the, of the project. So um, businesses, they tried, uh, project managers will try to avoid the scope uh, creep by um, having specific uh, ways in which you can change the specifications of the project. So it can't just be on the fly. It has, you might have to have a special kind of priority system to identify when you can change something that was set out at the beginning. Uh, with all uh, projects, the main dimensions for uh, trade-offs in the project are scope and uh, cost and time. And this is a figure on page uh, 106 of the book. They show uh, the project management trade-off. It's a triangle. Let me draw the triangle. So this is the uh, project management trade-off. And a lot of times, um, uh, the budget of the project is related to the cost of the budget. And you have um, uh, the schedule is time. And you have uh, the performance is scope. And uh, 
sometimes when you um, might get a reduction in your budget, uh, this might mean that it's, your project could take more time. Uh, or if it might have an impact on the performance of the outcome. And so you might have uh, different pressures on the project along the way, and you have to decide uh, which things you can give up a little bit. There's another, uh, there's a priority trade-off system where if you look at the constraints of the project, this is a fixed uh, parameter requirement. So if we have a constraint, this is something that you can't uh, give up. You need to, you're limited in that you can't have any um, lower quality in that constraint. It might have to do with, um, so this is almost like a must, a must have. It's a limit to what you can accept on, on, a, on a project or a certain aspect of the project. It might have to do with like um, environmental regulations, for example. So uh, you could have, just as an example, environmental regulations. So you, you can't go beyond a certain point. You have to have, there's a, there's a constraint in which you have to satisfy. And then there's enhance. And this is uh, an optimizing parameter over others. So if you could improve some aspect of the project, whether it's the cost, you could reduce the cost, or you can reduce the time that it takes to market, <coughs> or you could improve the performance, which would you most like to enhance? So. So this is optimizing. And then you have, uh, you have this uh, third one, uh, accept. And this is reducing or not meeting a parameter requirement. So if, if you had to accept something uh, not being the, at its optimal, which one, which one of these parameters could you accept? So um, picking the parameter that you could accept reduced um, reduced or not up to requirement. Okay. So the way um, to look at this, okay, this is the scope triangle, is um, they give an example in the book and um, uh, says under constraint that the original parameter is fixed and the project must be meet the completion date. Um, let me see. Okay, so if they're willing to um, um, in this case they're having a limitation on performance. So it may, means that they have to, they can't, uh, they have to have this within a certain level of performance. If you're looking at like, um, like a, a backup energy uh, system for a hospital, that has to be able to perform 
uh, and be reliable 99.9% .9 of the time or something like that. Very high re requirements for performance. And uh, so <coughs> they can't give up on that parameter. If they can't give up on that parameter, that means that uh, you, you can't have cost and time as the constraint parameter if it's performance. If you have the constraint par parameter as cost, say I don't have any more money, I cannot go beyond a certain limit, then you can't have these two as the constraints. So you have to decide which is your constraint parameter. And then if you have um, uh, enhancement, what would you most want to enhance if you can en enhance one of the parameters? You could say that if it was a uh, strategic system, like a new version of a telephone, and you wanted to get it to market really quickly, you could say that I would most like to enhance the time parameter. I want to do it quicker. So this is, if I want to do this uh, the most uh, quicker, then I cannot, uh, I cannot enhance performance and cost. Because in order to do it faster, I might have to hire more people. So you're only optimizing one of the parameters. And then it accept, uh, you might say that if I'm getting better performance out of my system, and I'm getting it quicker to market, then it's going to cost me more uh, to do it. So then I am uh, accepting a higher cost. So if I, again, if I pick this as an acceptance parameter, then I don't pick these two. And so it's, you have one dot in each column, basically. And the way you use this, um, this is part of establishing project priorities in step two is that if you need to change step one, which is the scope of the project, you look at this uh, process that you did in step two, and this gives you an indication of how you can accept changes in the scope of the project. So when can you accept changes in, it's going to take me more time? When can you accept changes in that it's going to cost me more? When can you accept changes in uh, performance being either optimal or not optimal. So you have to look at how you set this up for your organization. <coughs> okay, uh, step three is the work breakdown structure. And you have a uh, exercise involving work breakdown structure uh, in your homework that's due next week. And it's just, it's not taking it out of the book, it's just made up uh, question. So uh, the work breakdown structure is a hierarchical map that identifies the um, work elements that are involved in the project. So it breaks it down into what's going to be delivered and who's, what kind of activities are going to take place in order to deliver uh, the, the end results of the project. So it um, says defines the relational relationship between the final deliverable and the sub-deliverables and the work packages. And it's uh, used uh, that when you have some tangible outputs from the project. There's another name when it's uh, using um, the processes. But uh, so this is sometimes used with the product outcomes, but uh, basically they are both work breakdown structures. We'll get to that later. So you have basically uh, levels of breakdown, and at the top it's the, it's the biggest, uh, broadest uh, area, which is the whole project. And when you do all the work, at the end of the day you're done with the project. But if you break that down further, you break it down into different types of major deliverables for your project. And these might have to do with your uh, goals that you set out, or your objectives that you set out for your project. And then you can further break this down into sub-deliverables, and at different levels, depending on 
uh, how your organization is split up. People uh, might break it down into numbers of levels that have to do with different functional areas of their organization as well. And at each uh, uh, sub-deliverable uh, level, it's you have to get done with the sub-deliverable outputs or results in order to uh, come up with a final result for the deliverable and then eventually for the whole project. At below the lower levels of the, uh, and this is, you don't know how many levels you have in between here. Uh, yeah, but at the, at the lowest sub-deliverable level, you usually have a cost account, or um, and this is called the work package area. And this is, you usually have one person who is responsible for the work package, and you have a cost account or an amount of budget or money that is going to be used to, uh, to complete that deliverable <coughs> and uh, assign workers to this. And then, um, uh, so uh, this is also uh, associated when you describe what's in the work package. You have uh, different activities that take place within the work package. So you have uh, an accounting center with a budget, and you have somebody that's in charge of the work package, and you have maybe several people from different areas of the organization working on a work package, and they have certain activities that they have to complete in the work package. So. Um, uh, the work, the uh, this structure uh, helps the project manager because it allows them to know how much it's going to cost in terms of budget cost and time and who has to do what within the organization. Uh, the um, it helps the organization develop a breakdown structure an organization breakdown structure, which assigns project responsibilities to different people or individuals within the organization. It helps to manage the schedule and the budget and define communication channels between different uh, people that are working on different project elements. OK, so um, I put in this slide, which is an uh, image that is taken from uh, and the sixth edition, page 110. And uh, this is um, an example of a work breakdown structure for a, some kind of a new uh, tablet uh, called eSlim. And um, they have said that they're going to write here, uh, they break it down into major deliverables, which is hardware, CPU, and they said there can be more things like software uh, uh, that has to do with the tablet. But they haven't written that in at all. But this can be much more detailed. But these are the major deliverables for the project. The goal of the project is to make this prototype. And uh, we have um, within uh, the hardware, this is bro broken down to the lowest manageable level of uh, is going to produce a frame, cameras, speakers, and antenna. And then these, who's ever going to do the frame, this will have a budget and a work package to do the frame. And to do the camera, there may be different phases that are involved in this, but there can be, so they have several work packages. And then they have for speaker work package and an antenna work package. And then <coughs> under the uh, CPU, they also have uh, different types of uh, sub-deliverables, power supply, uh, memory, and I.O. controller. And they haven't filled in all of this. They're just leaving that out. But they get into more detail about this. And this keyboard touch center's backlight resolution is also broken down into several work packages. And this was from the previous version of the book. They were doing a 
personal computer prototype, so it's it's similar. So the work package is the lowest level of the work breakdown structure. It's the um, it's output oriented, so you have to identify what work is going to get done. You identify the time it's going to take to complete the work, and they were saying in the book that it should not be more than 10 days. But if it is more than 10 days, that you should have some um, uh, benchmark measuring in between how far you've come in the work. Uh, I think that's uh, that there's no strict rule of thumb if you have to find longer work package uh, periods. That's OK, too. You just need to uh, have checks for the progress in the work package. Uh, and then it says, identifies the time phase budget to complete the work package. So this means that you get a certain amount of money that's used on doing this task that's defined in this work package. And if you go over budget, then that gets noted in the, in the progress report. Um, you identify the resources that you needed to complete the work. And the resources uh, can mean that how many people are working on it. And like how much um, um, c computer time is needed, or some something like that. But it, whatever it costs in terms of uh, completing the work uh, task, and then identifying the person responsible for the unit. So that uh, should actually be at the top, who's responsible, and then defining underneath what are the the time frame, the cost, and what is going to be done in the work package. OK. Um, and then uh, step four is uh, the organization integrating the work breakdown structure into the organization, which is organization breakdown structure. And it says this is how the firm is going to make people work on the work packages. How are they going to distribute the work? And it provides a, a summary of the work units that are going to work on each of the, the identifiable areas. <coughs> so again, I copied the picture from the book, uh, which is on page 114 of the sixth edition. And it points out that you have um, different uh, uh, task design, test production, and outsourcing. And you have, uh, these are uh, maybe the activities that are going to be needed to uh, work on each of these different areas. And you have an accounting uh, for each of these areas. And you will have certain people that are working in the organization that work in these areas of the organization that are working on this work package. So they'll be in a cost account for each of the, this one, remember, had four work packages. This one only had one work package. And then they will all be, um, be able to match up later what it costs to do them. And this is the uh, same thing you could see from a previous book. They also had work packages here, and how much uh, time it takes, and the budgets it's used on them. But the discussion of costing will come up in the next chapter, so you spend more time on that later. And then you have the coding of the uh, work breakdown structure for information systems. and. Um, Okay, so uh, basically what they're telling you here is that you can code it in a way using indents to indicate the level of the, of the work package element in this system. Uh, so an example is this, where you have um, the computer project was the main project. And then you have, th this is uh, sub uh, deliverables, disk storage unit. And then it gets down to the work packages at the lowest level. And they're just using an indenting system and a, num and a numeric system to be able to code them. And this is uh, traced back for the accounting system. And this is the picture from this uh, year's book, 
which is the eSlim tablet. And again, you have the hardware, the CPU, the flash ROM, uh, touch screen, and the touch sensors. And these are all within this CPU. And the, the thing about this, it's you could do it in Excel or something. You just have uh, these different uh, layers, and then you can continue to insert additional layers uh, if you have more tasks that have to go in later on. Okay, what I wanted to point out is that, and this should help you with your homework as well, is that uh, process-oriented projects, they sometimes call it process breakdown structure, but it's actually the same thing as the work breakdown structure. It's just called something different. Um, so these have to do with completing a process in the amount of time uh, that you need to do each phase of the process. Instead of having a uh, producing a screen for a uh, for a phone, a telephone, you might be producing a, a step in your in your phase, and so. When uh, the homework assignment talks about using a, or creating a, an ERP system and uh, using this across several organizations, and then there's a bunch of activities that have to be done, you could think of those activities as um, uh, the, 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 the manager has to manage different uh, phases of the project. And at the end, you have a, a system that works for the whole organization. So it's more, li it's more like an information, it's an information systems project. It's not a, I'm going to build a chair type of project. I'm not, it's, so it's, it's a process, it's dealing with processes rather than products. So uh, it says that um, when you have a process breakdown structure, uh, the deliverables are completion of the phase of the project in order to get to the next phase of the project. And the, um, you, you can still have checkpoints. You have quality checkpoints along the way to make sure that you've completed that phase correctly. And then you still have sign-off by the customer or the stakeholders that have to do with monitoring each stage of the process. So <coughs> often software development projects are broken down into major phases like analysis, design, construction, testing, and rollout. And this is similar to your homework assignment where you, you talk about uh, these different phases of ins instilling uh, and putting in a, an ERP system and testing it and rolling it out, for example. Okay? And then you have different uh, levels of activities within each of these phases. And this picture here only shows the design phase. So you can imagine that at these lower levels that there's something to do in terms of analysis uh, as well. This has a breakdown structure. And uh, con construction has a breakdown structure. And testing has a breakdown structure. And rollout has a breakdown structure. So it all has uh, something that can be broken down. And then at the at so in the design phase, you might have at the lower levels you have um, define the application architecture, define the processing flow, design the logical database structure, design the system interfaces. And here we have uh, design phase deliverables would be uh, what is the output from this process? Uh, you have an application architecture, the application flow charts. Uh, the database design, the end user interface design, the workflow diagram, and the user document outline. So this might be the output of the design phase. And this is, um, these are like um, the activities that need to be done in order to get to this design phase, the to, to get to the deliverables of the design phase. And this can also use um, a responsibility matrix. Um, I guess when I, I wanted to go, just go back up to uh, 
so this is the, um, you just go back to the work breakdown structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you looked at your, um, your problem or your exercise, this would have something to do with, um, <coughs> you have several activities uh, that you are necessary. And these are select a system vendor, negotiation, customization, acceptance testing, uh, training, uh, uh, data conversion and loading, uh, test period, and system takeover. So these are similar to what we talked about before in this uh, process breakdown structure. <coughs> but also this has to uh, work in different locations. And <coughs> I'm thinking that <coughs> there's some things that uh, you, you can, you st you're still making a work breakdown structure, but you're, it's, it's like the process breakdown structure. And you're still um, putting the lowest level of deliverables at the lowest level, and then the work packages underneath that level. But there may be like some things that you need to do at centrally, and then some things you need to do at the location. So <coughs> even though you might be uh, picking a system centrally, you're not doing this at all the locations. But some things that you might be doing at all the locations are like the um, <coughs> testing of the system or the system takeover. So that might be done at all the locations. So you're not, because it's, it is a, everything that we talk about is a work breakdown structure, but because the book identified it as a, um, <coughs> as a process breakdown structure, it's, it's still a work breakdown structure is what I'm saying. It's the same thing, okay? <laughs> so you're still breaking down the work <laughs> into work packages. <laughs> So another way that um, you can identify who does work on different work packages is to create a responsibility matrix. And this is a list of the activities, activities that would be listed within the work packages and the participants and who's going to be working on the different activities. So this is an example of uh, tasks that have to be done. And this could be um, um, within one work package, for example. And the, the work package might be do a survey and file a report. And that, those are the deliverables of the work package. And the different project team members will be doing different tasks within different activities within the work package. And if it's person is responsible for tasks, they have an R, and if it's they're just helping with a task, they have an S. <coughs> so that's another picture of a responsibility matrix. <coughs> and they have different roles. So this one has role of responsible, support, consultant, and a notification and approval. So you sometimes people can have different roles for different parts or different tasks within the, within the uh, uh, project. Okay, um, I guess we can take a short break and then <coughs> I will spend a little bit more time on this. It's, although we are almost to the end, but we'll just take like maybe like a five minute break because then when we come back it'll only be a short time until we're finished with the chapter.